Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. All these cases took place in the 1990s. In 1993, Jane Furlong was top of her class in English. Her friends described her as a talented poet. The spirited teenager had dreams of becoming a child psychologist. But by the time she was 17, her life was taking a different track. And in fact, she was using her street smarts to survive. Jane's mother had been unable to care for her. So Jane was placed in a children's home, then fostered around the age of 11. It's believed this unstable family life deeply affected Jane. She attended several different high schools, and although she excelled academically, she lacked focus and was known to skip classes and require regular discipline. Eventually, Jane's love of adventure and partying overtook her career goals, and she stopped turning up to class altogether. Unskilled and too young to receive a benefit, Jane unintentionally discovered she could make good money in sex work. Working on the streets hardened the 15-year-old. She grew increasingly more interested in the occult, and her writing portrayed a very troubled young woman. But somehow she still believed in love, and fell head over heels quickly with Daniel Norsworthy. It wasn't long before the couple had a son, Aidan, and Jane stayed home to care for him until financial pressures saw her return to working on the streets. On May 26, 1993, Jane was dropped off around 8pm by Daniel on Auckland's Karangahapi Road. Their son Aidan was just six months old, and the couple had just moved into an Onehanga home, which they shared with others. When Daniel returned to K Road a short time later, Jane was gone. Daniel reported her missing two days after she was last seen. It would be 19 years before Jane was found. On the 19th of May 2012, a woman walking her dog at Sunset Beach, Port Waikato, nearly 100 kilometres away from Auckland, saw a human skull in the sand dunes. DNA testing later revealed it was Jane. The next year, police announced a $50,000 reward for anyone who provided information or evidence that would lead to the conviction of Jane's killer. Do you have any firm suspects, anyone that you think this is who we think did it? We've come a long, long way. We're now at a point that we believe that we've got the significant people of interest that we believe that this reward will hopefully generate that last piece to fall into place. Jane's boyfriend Daniel initially declined to speak to the police after Jane's body was found, but eventually met with them more than a year later. Despite the $50,000 cash offer, a major police investigation spanning more than 26 years dubbed Operation Dahlia, an arrest is yet to be made. Friends and family members said Jane knew a lot of information about the wrong people. She was due to give evidence at two criminal trials, one involving gangs and another relating to a businessman attacking sex workers when she mysteriously went missing. It's important to note that this businessman was in custody at the time Jane disappeared. In 2019, Wayne McGrath, who outed himself as a suspect in Jane's cold case, was due to be released from prison after being convicted of raping Jane's best friend, Amanda Wolfe. She and boyfriend Daniel had a dispute with McGrath over a vehicle. She and Daniel confronted Wayne and a group of his friends at a West Auckland factory. Jane was armed with a knife, but they were met with someone wielding a crossbow. Luckily, the police intervened before it turned violent. According to news website Stuff, they claimed they had identified a Port Waikato home owned by the McGrath family at the time Jane disappeared. 
This is located just 600 metres from where Jane's remains were found. Two families who purchased the property since Jane was found said they didn't believe the police had ever searched the property. Jane's case was the first unsolved murder to be featured on the second series of TVNZ's Cold Case, which aired in June 2019. On this episode, police revealed that they had identified a person of interest. While they didn't name the person, police said he was an associate of Jane's and Daniel's who had a strong connection with the Port Waikato area. Detective Inspector Paul Newman said a small team was currently working on Operation Dahlia and since this show aired, they had received new information from the public. There are several key areas where police hope the TV series Cold Case might encourage people to come forward with new evidence. During this episode on Jane's case, it was revealed that Jane's favourite leather jacket, which she was wearing on the night she disappeared, was not found in her grave. The detectives wonder if someone might have seen it or even been gifted it by the killer. Some people with connections to this person of interest have refused to engage with police. Inspector Newman thinks that the burden of guilt might be getting too heavy for these individuals. Jane's profession made sensational headlines in the 1990s. Sex work wasn't decriminalised in New Zealand until 2003. By today's standards, some could say that the news reports were pretty much irresponsible. She's 17, a mother, a drug user and a prostitute. And she's missing. Journalist and author of the book The Short Life and Mysterious Death of Jane Furlong, Kelly Dennett, says she was a normal teenager, a mother, girlfriend and daughter. If Jane were alive today, she would be in her 40s. Her only son, who she gave birth to just months before she went missing, is now older than she was when she died. At Jane's funeral, her mother Judith said, for as long as I can remember, Jane has had a daring and fearless spirit. She said she did not deserve this evil. An evil is what it was. In April of 1998, the murder of Claire Hills was without a doubt one of New Zealand's most bizarre and brutal killings. The 30-year-old was driving her black Mazda hatchback to Auckland's International Airport's McDonald's where she worked. She was due to start her shift at 3.30am. It was 5.45am. Dawn was breaking. A woman walking on the domain at Mangere Mountain noticed a man acting strangely around a car parked near the soccer club rooms. As she watched, a flash appeared from nowhere. The woman soon realised the car had been set on fire. Unseen, the woman froze as she realised the man was running straight towards her. She saw his face clearly before he saw her. He stopped in his tracks, shocked and flustered. They eyeballed each other. Time seemed to stop before he turned on his heels to flee in the opposite direction. The female witness ran to a nearby house to call police. The fire service was notified about the fire at 6.05 a.m., but the officer who took the call failed to contact the fire service. By the time the fire brigade actually arrived on the scene, it was 6.32 a.m. They discovered Claire Hill's burnt-out vehicle. Claire had been bound, placed in the rear of the vehicle, doused with petrol and burnt alive. While the delay in notifying the fire service would not have saved her life, valuable forensic evidence was lost. Police can only guess Claire met her killer sometime after 2am. Whatever happened in the three hours before her death remains a mystery. 
a post-mortem examination showed Claire had died in the fire. There was soot in her lungs. There was also evidence she had been sexually assaulted. Nothing found in or around the car could have been used to set it on fire. The killer must have bought or stolen a container of fuel. Luckily, the police found a sample of the killer's DNA. But over 20 years, a matching sample has not turned up in their database. There were, however, a number of other witnesses who saw the suspect escaping the scene. A jogger at the domain saw him running away. A taxi driver on the motorway said a man ran out in front of his car. And another motorist saw a man walking towards the Mangari Bridge shops. Their descriptions help police create a sketch of the killer. Very little is really known about Claire. She was a private person, but she did have a somewhat mysterious childhood. She arrived in New Zealand at age 15, having run away from home in Australia. She and her then boyfriend somehow gained access to the country on a false passport, and they'd lived here ever since. When Claire got to New Zealand, she took the new name of Lisa, and although she eventually reconciled with her family, never showed an interest to return to Australia. At the time of her death, she had renounced the Jehovah Witnesses she'd joined at age 21. She'd separated from her husband, Peter Hills, and was living on her own in Hearn Bay and working at McDonald's. For many years, police believed they knew who the killer was, telling Claire's family they didn't have the evidence to charge him. However, in 2007, they discovered the suspect's DNA didn't match that found at the scene and were forced to rule him out. After a visit to New Zealand in 2011 and a meeting with the police, Claire's family claimed they didn't think the killer would ever be found. They said too much time had passed and they believed too many errors were made early in the investigation. Although they hold no malice against the detectives, Claire's mother said the focus on the wrong suspect, Claire's involvement with the Jehovah's Witness Church, and the fact that she changed her name may have hindered the investigation. Claire's file remains open under the eye of Detective Superintendent Dave Lynch. He says, quote, I'm still convinced there's a person or small group out there that know or have very strong suspicions around what happened. He says, I always hold out hope one day someone will pick up the phone. In December of 1998, on a hot afternoon in Ashburton, an excited 15-year-old Kirsty Bentley was taking her dog Abby for a walk. It was New Year's Eve and there were plans to have a family dinner including her new boyfriend. But Kirsty would never return home. Over 20 years later, the mystery of what happened to Kirsty Bentley and who was responsible is left unknown. When Kirsty's mother Jill arrived home just after 5 p.m., Kirsty hadn't returned and they soon contacted the police and began searching for her. The following morning, Kirsty's underwear was found on the riverbank along with Abby, who was tied to a tree nearby. 17 days later, two men looking for a cannabis plantation stumbled across Kirsty's body near the Rakaia River, nearly 60 kilometres from Ashburton. It had been hidden in scrub, was lying in the fetal position, but by then was so badly decomposed, little forensic evidence could be gathered. Following an inquest into Bentley's murder in 2016, the pathologist determined Kirsty was killed by blunt force trauma to the right side of the back of her head. It's believed she would have died shortly after the wound was inflicted. Police, however, believed Kirsty had not been killed at the Ashburton River where her clothes and dog were found, insisting this scene had been staged by the murderer. The coroner said during the 2016 inquest it was likely that Kirsty was placed in the Camp Gully area the same night, based on the examination of her stomach contents and the state of her body. 
Almost immediately, suspicion fell on Kirsty's father, Sid, and her brother, John. John had been the last person to see Kirsty, and Sid had trouble recalling what his schedule was that day. A theory arose that John had killed his sister, and because he couldn't drive, Sid had helped him dispose of the body. But there was little sense of motive and no evidence at all, and both John and Sid completely denied any involvement. Sid died in 2015, age 64. In the months after her death, police asked the public for information about a green comma van which was reportedly seen in the area at the time of Kirsty's disappearance and over the following days in the mid-Canterbury town as well as the Camp Gully area. It has never been traced. In March 2017, Detective Inspector Greg Merton confirmed he was looking at double Ashburton work and income killer Russell Tully as a possible suspect in Kirsty's murder. The former local diesel mechanic was ruled out in 2016 after Merton quizzed him behind bars and came away satisfied with his alibi. Then in December 2018, Merton announced new tests were being carried out to try and trace the killer. The dog leash found around Abby's neck tying her to a tree at the Ashburton Riverbank was thought not to belong to the Bentleys. The dog leash, along with underwear found nearby, were included in new tests carried out by scientists at the Institute of Environmental Science and Research. Detective Inspector Greg Merton, who took charge of the unsolved crime file case in 2014, cautioned that final answers still may be some way off. Kirsty's case remains open and investigations continue. In 1997, Japanese tourist Kaio Matsuzawa had come to New Zealand for a working holiday. Kaio was planning to return to her hometown of Yamagata, but before this, she was planning just a few more days of adventure, exploring the city of Auckland. What's heartbreaking about Kaio's story is that her mother had only allowed her to come on the working holiday because she swore that New Zealand was a much nicer and safer place than other countries. Kaio's plan was to learn English in New Zealand for a year. In Christchurch, she enrolled at the Dominion English School and she worked in a restaurant too. At the school, she met her friend Naomi Seishu, who she flattered and travelled New Zealand with, including visiting Queenstown. Naomi said Kaio was such a happy, cheerful person. Kaio arrived in Auckland on September 11, 1998. CCTV footage shows her getting off a bus at 2.41pm. She checked into a Queen Street backpackers for three nights, left her luggage in room 25, then went out again. Her body was found 10 days later in a fire alarm cupboard in the Centre Court building on Queen Street, near the backpackers. This was by a technician doing a routine check. The area was accessible only by swipe card, which made the decision to dump Kayo's body in this location perplexing. It was unclear how she had been killed, but forensic material was able to be taken from the scene. However, despite finding some of her possessions in rubbish bins around the city and offering a $75,000 reward, nobody has ever been charged with Kayo's murder. Then, many years later, following the screening of TVNZ's cold case episode focusing on Kayo's case in 2018, the police revealed they had a new suspect in the 21-year-old cold case. Banking records also proved the new suspect was in the immediate vicinity where Kayo's body was found. However, police have remained tight-lipped over the person of interest, who used a bank card at a nearby BNZ ATM on September 11, 1998. 
the day Kaio went missing. This new piece of evidence also came to light on this episode, after unknown male DNA was located under Kaio's fingernails. Sadly, there have been no further updates on Kaio's case since. Kaio was a daughter, younger sister, flatmate, friend, and if she were alive today, she would have been an aunt. If you're like me in listening to these cases, no doubt you're feeling frustrated, sad, angry. And although it may seem difficult to find justice for these victims, it's not impossible. In fact, arrests have recently been made in the 1995 cold case murder of Angela Blackmore. It's important we don't lose hope and keep these stories fresh in the public's mind. You never know who may one day find the courage to come forward. If you're interested in me making a video on a particular unsolved or solved New Zealand case, do write me a comment below and as usual, thanks guys for watching and do stay safe.